It felt like for him he was standing at the edge of a cliff, staring into this dark chasm. He wasn't physically standing, but spiritually he was standing there, pondering if he should just give it all up. Stop following Jesus and follow a different way. He had been questioned by some of his friends of saying that, well, the Bible's just a Greek myth. It's just full of fables and tales. It's not really real. It's just more about moral teachings of Jesus. And so he was ready just to, to punt it all away. And she came to him in the middle of the night, prayed over him, talked to him, cajoled him. And through those prayers and through her mentorship, his life changed, the spirit came, and he was revived. There was another young man who had read some of her literature that she had published, talked to her, and through the years as it came, it helped him as he was disillusioned with the church and with the elders who were berating him about his call and about where he was ministering to. And then there was another young man who decided to come to this big church because it was full of great contacts for his business. He could rub elbows with them and, and maybe make a few sales and uh, get involved that way. She took him by the hand and led him eventually to the Lord Jesus Christ, where he submitted his life to, to Jesus. She's kind of an obscure lady. She was born in North Dakota, eventually moved to Minnesota, and, uh, and was part of a church there, and she was known for her great Sunday school classes. And it just so happened she was in the Los Angeles area and met up with the pastor of First Presbyterian Church of Hollywood, Hollywood Prez. And he invited her to be the head of his Christian education group at the church. Her name, pretty obscure, Henrietta Mears. Henrietta Mears. She led a, a group that started off probably about 200 people in her Sunday school class. And over the next 30, 40 years, it grew to about 6,000 in Sunday school, 6,000. And those three men, the one who was standing on that precipice, the one who was disillusioned, and the one who came to hobnob among the church, well, the first one is Billy Graham. Billy Graham, in the middle of the night before the Crusades, his Los Angeles Crusades events, thought about just giving it up, thought about just walking away until he met Henrietta. In the next few weeks, the Los Angeles events took place, and they were a huge success as thousands of people came to know the Lord Jesus and propelled Billy Graham into the spotlight as the great evangelist from America. And millions upon millions of people have come to hear God's word, the true, clear gospel of the kingdom through Billy Graham, through his crusades, through the radio, TV, media, print media, all of that. Millions upon millions, they say even 2.2 billion have heard the message from Billy Graham about Jesus Christ. A young man who was disillusioned, he was, he was berated by his church elders to stop ministering to the youth and to find some other productive avenue. But he wouldn't and couldn't follow that. His passion was for children, the kids, to hear the clear gospel truth of the kingdom. His name? Jim Rayburn who's dear to my heart because I was on staff with Young Life. He is the founder of Young Life, 
with over 7,000 schools here in the United States who, who have a presence on their campus uh, with ministers from Young Life in over 100 countries. And in a year, they will talk to about 2 million kids all over the world about Jesus Christ. And that little businessman who was trying to rub elbows with people, well, his name was Bill Bright. Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade, crew as it's called. You know, they have a little film called uh, Jesus Film. Pretty catchy, isn't it? The Jesus Film. The most watched film in all of the universe. 6.5 billion people have watched that film. 6.5 billion people. Over 230 million people have come to know Jesus Christ through that small little tool that Campus Crusade uses. In over 1,400 languages, 35,000 missionaries across the world in over 200 countries. All because of this, well, this lady from the Midwest who decided to go to Hollywood and start a Sunday school class. Not because she wanted to be famous or popular. It was because she understood the gospel in her life. Saved by grace, but she was overwhelmed by God's grace, the way she lived. Lived by grace, lived through grace, embedded by grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And she would pray for people to come to know the Lord, but to just not know Him, but that they would drink deeply from Him and not be satisfied with just a taste or a tidbit of Jesus Christ to be overwhelmed by that love. That's what would drive her to pray for each and every one of those people. From a Bill Bright to a Billy Graham to, to Jim Rayburn or Dawson Troutman, who was the head of Navigators, or Richard Halverson, who was the United States chaplain for many years. Even movie stars like my namesake, Dale Evans. <laughs> That's why I never liked that name, because my brother said it was a girl's name. <laughs> Roy Rogers and Dale Evans and all these movie stars, they flocked over there because they heard something that they thirsted for, something that would give them life and meaning and not emptiness. And that was the gospel that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Her prayers resound and, and sound much like that, the, the prayers that we will hear today or have heard today in, in the letter to the Thessalonians. Paul is writing to them. Like Patrick talked about last week, he planted a church in Thessalonica. Stood, stayed there for a few weeks, a month or so, and then he was driven out, pushed out. Not in a nice way, not a knock on the door. You need to leave, Paul. It was pitchforks and tar, and, and you better get out of here because things are going to get worse. And so Paul is driven out, but he hasn't forgotten the people that, that belong in Thessalonica to Jesus Christ. He yearns to know about them. He is anxious to know if, if in their new faith and in the persecution that they're facing, will they survive? Will they be that seed that is planted in good ground that will, will rise up and produce fruit? And so he sends Timothy, and, and Timothy reports back that indeed they have stayed faithful in the midst of persecution. You know, we're not quite sure what the persecution looks like. We know it's dark. We know it's mean and wicked and evil. It may come from the Roman Empire. It may come from their fellow Gentiles. It may even come from the Jews in that area. We're not sure what it looks like, but we do know that there's darkness and wickedness that is going on. We do know 
that, that uh, the status quo has been changed. Wherever Paul goes, it seems like he gets thrown out of the place where he's at. Wherever he plants a church or wherever he ministers to a group that is following Jesus Christ, he usually gets either thrown out or put in prison. <laughs> nice resume there, right? <laughs> And it, it's, it's the upsetting of the status quo, I believe, that makes him a marked man. The culture of the day is, is a dog-eat-dog kind of world, survival of the fittest. You want to talk about the real one percenters? Well, you're looking at the Roman Empire. You're either elite or you're not elite. Just like many of the third world countries here, you either have it or you don't have it. And if you don't have it, too bad. But if you can find a benefactor who can help you make a step, push you along the way, give you a little step up, and if you can kind of, you know, maybe kick somebody off to the side or stab somebody in the back to get that benefactor, well, so be it. That's the lifestyle. That's the culture. But when the gospel comes, it changes people. It changes people instead of stabbing somebody in the back or pushing somebody aside or me first. It's a God change, a grace that overflows into your life where you talk about loving your enemy and loving your brother and sister in a way that puts them up first instead of yourself. Instead of stabbing in the back, there's a wholeness that the gospel brings. There's nothing like changing the status quo to get people up in arms. You take a little bit from his pocket, that's okay. But when you take from my pocket, you better watch out. Paul faces that everywhere he goes. And he's concerned because this church is under pressure. Day after day after day, the darkness and the wickedness desire to put that fire and that light out. Listen to Paul's prayer at the end of this, uh, this verse in chapter 12, or verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. May we come to you. We're hoping to. May the Lord, may the Lord make you increase abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. That's his prayer. That's his prayer throughout this letter, that they would have hope, steadfast hope, but that their love would increase not just for themselves, but for their brothers and sisters and for the church. What a difference between I'm going to step on you and get my way to I will build you up in Jesus Christ and see what value you have in God's eyes. See how much you're worth in God's kingdom. Death instead of life is what Paul is calling. He's calling for life, sorry, life instead of death. Hope instead of demise and disappointment. Much like Henrietta Mears, her desire, her desire was not to be this famous Sunday school teacher from Hollywood Prez who never actually preached from the pulpit, but called leaders to come and help teach people, to, to grow them up and mature them in the, in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was her calling because she was so embedded in the gospel, so dependent upon Jesus Christ. I wonder what it would look in this time of great darkness, not just in our country, but in the world, if we would come together as the body of Christ, not just Christ Episcopal Church, but churches all around, that we would pray that, that the body of Christ's love would increase and grow, that they would know Jesus Christ more and more deeply, richly. And not only that, 
I wonder what it would look like if we made space for Jesus. If we would really study his word deeply, pray through his scriptures deeply. You know, Gavin talked at the nine o'clock about his, uh, his mission trip to Guatemala where every day, six o'clock in the morning, these young people from high school to college, Jane Beck is one of them, who woke up at 6 a.m. during the summer in a foreign country to read scripture and to pray two hours a day. And how, I wonder how those prayers and how the study of God's word in the body of Christ would impact us, would impact our culture, would impact the darkness of this world and of this country, that the light of the gospel would come. Like it came through this Midwestern little old lady from Minnesota to Hollywood, California. And you may not be a Bill Bright or Jim Rayburn or Billy Graham, but God, trust me, God in his adequacy can supply our inadequacy. So we take the challenge. Amen.